to all the team for inviting me to this event. Uh, really happy to, to be there to contribute to the discussion. So um, about my presentation, I'm going to give, um, let's say, background of the influence of um, the history of the influence of the fossil fuel industry in the climate talks, try to give a sense of their strategies and, and some thoughts about our own strategies to um, counter them. Uh, I will try to be as, as short um, as possible to allow the discussion. So let me share my screen. Okay, I think that should work now. Yeah, great. So um, I'm, I think everyone is, is familiar um, in, in this call about the unprecedented uh, climate catastrophe that is everywhere um, happening now with this world. I'm not going to give more details about this because I think other uh, presentation will, will dig into, into that. Just want you to state something as an introduction that I everyone and the majority of people, even outside um, climate movements, are well aware of uh, who are the responsible for climate change. And we basically know um, it's the fossil fuel industry and polluting industries in general. And yet we all see that their voice is basically everywhere in, in climate discussions at all level, be it at UN level or more regional levels. So the question is, is basically how did they manage to get uh, that much um, uh, influence over this discussion and, and how can we do to counter them? So the first um, slide, it doesn't, yeah, I, I'm not sure it's really showing uh, full screen. Uh, can you just let me know if that's okay because I, I don't see that. Okay. We, we can see it a lot of it. It's not in full screen mode, but we can, it seems pretty readable to me. Okay, I'm just going to try to fix that now. Yeah. Anyway, I, I would just go like this and not to waste some time. Uh, yeah, so just to say that uh, since the beginning of uh, the UNFCCC, that was in 1992, uh, big business and of course, more specifically, uh, the fossil fuel industry have been really pushing to be inside of the talks part of the discussions and also, and more importantly, um, be seen as the solution rather than the problem. I'm going to give some kind of big milestones of um, how did they manage to, um, to influence the, the discussion. So, um, oh, what's going on there? Sorry <laughs> about this. So um, just to start with uh, the creation of this big international um, corporate lobby group, the Business Council uh, for Sustainable Development. Um, they really were created to make a business voice heard into the climate talks and was their first construction uh, as, a, as lobbying. Then you have a bit more later carbon market, um, carbon markets and offset that was really agreed um, to be part um, of the Kyoto Protocol and really putting market-based solution to the climate crisis at the center um, of the discussions. Then the UN Global Contact, uh, all about um, voluntary corporate social um, responsibility instead of binding regulations. Um, then you have a bit more later some um, uh, COP, like the one in Copenhagen um, in 2009, that was really the watershed moment uh, for business participation with a delegation of more than 500 um, lobbies from the industry participating. And then more obviously the, the corporate sponsorships of the, of the COP that was, uh, for instance, in Warsaw with a big fossil fuel industry, national fossil fuel industry, uh, really sponsoring the talks. And finally, last year in Madrid, um, also some of the country's biggest polluters being sponsoring uh, the talks. And those very quick examples just show us how, how did the big business and the fossil fuel industry really achieve some big things, which is basically first having voluntary action instead of regulations and also having some topics um, like that reflect their own interest to be put at the heart of the discussions and pushing their full solution as the way forward um, to solve the climate crisis. So um, these kind of big moments represent a bit um, those, those tactics that they're having. 
and what are those four solutions that they're uh, pushing forward and that they try to influence um, decision making. So we call them four solutions because basically they are just a way of um, pushing for a market-based solution that can profit financially to, um, to those companies and also techno fixes that just try to mask the continued existence of dirty business models that are in the first place responsible for climate change. Those five solutions really preempt uh, the only efficient way to solve the climate crisis, which is basically letting fossil, fuel in, fossil fuels in the ground and having real binding um, regulations to, um, to yeah, solve the climate crisis. Though, there is here an infographic um, uh, that you can see and that um, give an overview of those four solutions. So you have natural gas, which is the industry's word for saying fossil gas, and that is um, only another fossil fuel. You have carbon capture and storage um, and carbon markets uh, offsets that are again um, for the CCS part, only risky, super uh, expensive and unproven technology to say, we can move forward by uh, exploiting more and more fossil fuels. That's okay. We will just take the emissions, put it in the ground or under the water and the problem is solved. Uh, carbon markets and offsets and climate natural solutions that are also market-based solution that don't solve the initial issue of um, exploiting uh, fossil fuels that also led um, talking about um, offsets and climate natural solutions um, led to some big um, human rights issues co conflict forced relocations and other uh, big issues and uh, again really leading to preempt real solutions uh, that I said previously, and that you all know about phasing out fossil fuels and um, having some binding regulations. So those are, are other uh, solutions. They they pretend to be uh, the solutions. Now I would like to dig a bit more into uh, their tactics and strategies to make those solutions uh, to be the decision made into climate um, negotiations. So we've seen before that one of the, the, the big entry point is to be part of the discussion, to be considered as a stakeholder, to be um, taken into account uh, in how um, politics, climate politics are made. Um, part of delegations in, in, uh, from some countries in many cases. And for that, they're using uh, a lobbying toolbox that um, they use all year long um, at member states level, also at regional levels. And it basically um, uh, is the most important point because this is how they are able to shape official positions. For that, they, they use a lot of different tactics within th this big uh, lobbying toolbox. So you have money with the low spending. Um, maybe some of you um, know about this, this uh, report that we published last year as a fossil free politics campaign, revealing that uh, since 2010, uh, the world's biggest uh, five industry uh, companies spent at least 251 million euros to lobby the EU. Uh, this is only the tip of the iceberg because, of course, these are only uh, numbers that we know about that are uh, voluntarily declared. So that gives you a sense of, of uh, the importance of, of lobbying for them to, to uh, reach their goals. And that money goes into a lot of different um, um, use, let's say, uh, like, for instance, um, hiring lobby guns, um, uh, lobby, um, lobby firms to further the, their messages and echo uh, their demands, using the revolving door, which is having some um, executive, uh, corporate executive, then going to, into public office. Uh, and that, of course, allows um, a lot of, of um, um, that makes easiest, easy, um, yeah, an easiest way for the industry to have access to decision makers. They also uh, finance studies and participate to expert group. And all of that, little by little, years after years, participate to shape um, policy making. One of these uh, lobbying tactics that I put apart is sponsorship, because this is obviously um, a big uh, issue for uh, COPs. 
and we've seen that in the previous uh, years. This is going to be a very big subject uh, for COP26. It already has been um, um, uh, challenged and, and, and thinking about last week revelation by uh, culture and stain and I think Lewis will talk more about this um, later but this is really a big issues a big issue and all of that is all about bringing uh, legitimacy really um, again being perceived as a legitimate um, stakeholder in, in deciding how are we going to tackle the climate crisis and the fossil fuel politics campaign is really about this, like destroying the legitimacy and the perception of uh, by the public and by decision makers that uh, the industry uh, should be part of uh, this discussion. I'm going to be a bit um, quick now because end of time is approaching. Um, how do we fight for a fossil free cops? So it has been said a bit earlier, and we also have to be realistic um, in the fact that the talks are most likely or unlikely to produce really anything uh, big and, and bold for the climate right now. But the fact of, of showing uh, growing public anger at the true reason, reasons for that, for how are the COPs not delivering anything for the climate yet, are really um, a big step in ending those close relationship and influence for the, the fossil fuel industry. And there's a lot of levels and, and um, a lot of strategies can be combined together from different groups to reach that goal. Uh, I think it's super important now more than ever to strengthen alliances between different groups, uh, different approaches, youth, uh, NGOs, other type of climate movement to uh, expose really the COP group capture every time that we can, intensify the public debate around this, um, demanding a fossil free COP that is already happening in the UK and we should uh, see how we can um, uh, support that uh, and derail every time the industry's uh, greenwash activities. I put uh, some images of past actions uh, during um, previous COPs. So the toxic, toxic tour is a really nice uh, tool that we're using at Corporate Europe Observatory, which is basically about toxifying the industry, showing what they're actually doing uh, to, in order to destroy their greenwash um, narrative. The creations, and I like this image of the lobbyists being surrounded by youth climate striker saying, we're watching you. Uh, finally, very quickly about the fossil free politics campaign and demands. I think Scott already explained the rationale of the campaign in the beginning. I'm not going to repeat, but um, just to, to explain how it is framed, we have four main demands that kind of are the structure of our um, actions and reflection, which is cutting the access of the fossil fuel industry to decision makers, uh, address vested interests, conflict of interest, and the preferential treatment of the industry that includes uh, being part of um, delegations to international uh, negotiations um, for the COP, for instance, and uh, finally rejecting partnerships, including sponsorship, which is a big, um, uh, yeah, which is very important in terms of uh, public legitimacy, destroying public legitimacy. I really hope this can contribute to the whole discussion. It's very quick uh, presentation, so I cannot really say more, but I would be happy to participate uh, to the breaking, uh, yeah, breakout group uh, discussions. Thank you again. Brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Lara. Um, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, particularly around like framing like the agendas that are being put forward, and yeah, the sheer scale of like the, the kind of lobbying activities going on, and yeah, and the spirit of like strengthening alliances. We definitely look forward to, to working more with you. Um, so, without further ado, we'll move. We'll now invite Trisha Reddy from Women African Alliance, um, which is a pan-African eco-feminist organisation working on the very intersected issues of climate um, and gender justice. Um, Trisha is Energy and Climate Justice Lead at the Women African Alliance. So, um, yeah, the Women African Alliance work to support women's organising and challenge the large scale extraction of natural resources within Africa, whilst also developing um, women centred alternatives. So, yeah, super excited to have Trisha with us. And, yeah, we'll just hand over to you now. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, it's really lovely to be here with all of you. Um, 
and uh, it's a very timely and important discussion. So happy to contribute to it. Um, I live in Johannesburg, South Africa, and uh, I'm guessing that um, most of you or all of you know at least some some things about South Africa. You know about uh, our struggles against um, apartheid, um, which is racialized insti uh, um, institutionalized racism. My apologies. Um, you know about our change to democracy and uh, the constitution that we developed, which is regarded as one of the most progressive constitutions across the world. You obviously know about the beauty of our lands and hopefully some of you have visited it as well. But I do wonder if you also know about our love or maybe I should say obsession with coal, uh, maybe infatuation, a very long obsession and infatuation, which is continued. Uh, with coal. Um, as you are getting out in Scotland out of coal, and rightly so, uh, because of how dirty and destructive it is, South Africa continues to be entrenched in the coal tradition. Uh, in fact, uh, we used coal, or what we called at that time cheap coal, to power up the mines and to, and which has led us into uh, an industrialized society. Um, it's something that has been termed by theorists, the minerals energy complex, and it's something that we still sit with today. Um, so we have, um, and sometimes the, the percentages are slightly different depending on what you read, but, uh, the sort of the most, uh, the biggest amount is sort of, we still have a 90% dependence on coal uh, for electricity in the country. Um, it has led to South Africa being one of the top polluters in the world. In fact, about two years ago, we were um, the 13th top polluter in the world. Uh, and most recently, we are still in the top 20 of the biggest polluters in the world, owing to this massive dependence on, on coal. Um, it's, uh, you know, obviously across Africa as well, we, we remain the top polluter, um, you know, by a, by a massive margin. Um, coal has also obviously led to a huge amount of ills in South Africa. Uh, obviously, massive um, health problems amongst our population, including coal miners, um, of which there are hundreds of thousands who are still within the coal sector. Um, we faced, I mean, people have faced massive land and water grabs and still continue to do in sort of new sacrifice zones, we call them in South Africa, where there's new coal expansion that's happening. Um, it's led to massive ecological uh, destruction and so on. Uh, so it's no wonder that coal obviously is, is known as a, a very dirty so, um, uh, form of fuel. Um, I mean, the lead, leading the charge, I guess, on this dependence on coal um, are two sort of, you could call them companies or institutions. It's ESCOM. Uh, which is our national utility, electricity utility, and, and SASOL, which used to be a state-owned company. ESCOM accounts for about 35% of all of pollution or greenhouse gas emissions in the country. That's pretty staggering, actually. And it's because ESCOM is sort of the main owner still of most of the coal fleet, the coal plants across the country. Um, and, and ESCOM is still planning on another 1,500 megawatts of new coal-fired power plants. This is excluding the two new uh, coal-fired power plants that we have that are just coming on stream and almost built, uh, which is Madupi and Kusile, which are two of the biggest coal-fired power plants across the world. And as I said, they're almost fully developed and, and still partly functioning. Uh, Sasol um, was a company that started off during the apartheid times um, and because there were sanctions against South Africa, we couldn't purchase oil um, from, from overseas. Um, and so did they, and so the South African government decided to develop this company which can convert coal to liquids. So that's what's how we would get our petroleum sources. Coal to liquids is a highly polluting and destructive technology. 
And Cecil continues into today. A few years ago, uh, Cecil's big call to liquid plants in a place called Secunda was the highest point source of pollution in the world. Now, why I mention these two sort of companies, organizations, ESCOM, of course, I should mention, is um, a state-owned uh, enterprise, um, but, it is, uh, but it operates on corporate principles because South Africa has a few years ago, many years ago now, uh, adopted very neoliberal principles in how it adopted all of its sort of um, uh, all of its activities, including electricity generation. So I mentioned this, and I mentioned this in detail, including the fact that both of these, well, I guess polluters um, have no intention of getting out of coal as well, of coal dependence. They have actually filed and have won postponements to meet air quality regulations. We had, after a very long struggle, uh, finally gotten in what we call minimum emission standards. So air quality regulations, which actually are not super ambitious. They, they're pretty uh, middle of the range. But ESCOM and SASOL applied initially for exemptions to meet these pollution standards. And then when there was advocacy against that, then decided to convert that to postponements to meet these air quality regulations. Mm -hmm. They were since basically uh, given those given those postponements, they were allowed those postponements. And they continue in the second five-year cycle, I think, of, of, um, of these emission standards, have continued to ask for postponements and have been given those postponements. So both, so this is, this is where the interesting piece comes in. Um, maybe interesting is too polite a word, but um, the interesting piece comes in, in terms of their influence uh, in these international negotiations. We found out a few years ago when South Africa hosted the COP uh, in Durban uh, that both ESCOM and SASOL are within the South African negotiating team. So they both sit, these polluters sit within the team itself, which is negotiating South Africa's position on climate in the international negotiations and the COP is, and the COPs as we know it. Um, we were fed this information, as in we as in civil society, was fed this information by other technical experts who are part of the team. And they were deeply disturbed by this because obviously those two polluters were having a massive influence as well on the negotiating position of South Africa in, in the climate negotiations. And this is not just about South Africa and the influence of just these polluters within the, um, within the South Africa's negotiating position. But South Africa tends to um, have a heavy, heavy influence in the African position uh, on negotiations because we are regarded somehow as the technical experts or, or South Africa has the most capacity and technical expertise in these areas. Uh, and because we're a sub-imperial power in the African region, South Africa tends to have an overwhelming influence on the African position. Um, our, our president, Nasrul Ramaphosa, is a leader in the African Union as well, which obviously there's a branch of it that is part of the negotiating team for climate. Um, and so there's these there's other influences as well. So then when we look at top polluters like ESCOM and, and SASOL being within these negotiating teams, you can see how, how, how damaging and destructive this influence can be, not just at a, at a, in a country uh, uh, perspective, but a regional perspective, and then globally as well. What's worse is that at the Copenhagen uh, um, COP, um, which is in 2009, I think, as well. South Africa decided to also, in, um, um, sorry, so South Africa is supposed to be operating within the Africa negotiating team, but South Africa decided to act unilaterally and um, sort of worked together with other top polluters, um, including the US, um, uh, Brazil, Russia, China, and China, India and China, um, to carve out um, a completely different deal, which was then pushed through at the at the COPs as well. Uh, betray, obviously, South Africa betraying Africa and the African position, which at that time was 
very progressive and very hard hitting and really spoke to um, sort of the, the, the sort of climate debt that is owed to Africa, the impacts that Africa will face and so on. Um, and so South Africa tends to, to play this, this uh, very, um, this influential but uh, really destructively influential role um, on many levels as well. And so when we talk about polluting companies or destructive polluting company influences, we have to consider all of this in the mix. Now beyond this, um, at an Africa-wide level, uh, we know that there's many transnational corporations that have a very destructive um, influence and impact um, across Africa in different African countries. I think the, the most notorious example has been Shell um, and Shell's sort of oil explorations in the Ogoni land in Nigeria. Uh, I mean, Shell still has a very destructive influence uh, in the Ogoni land, um, and communities are still fighting right now um, to stop the new expansions that Shell wants to undertake, also under different guises. Now, uh, Shell is sort of um, uh, pretending to be part of a sort of uh, a nationally owned uh, company. So they, they sort of change their face and their, and their strategy uh, depending on, on sort of what's what comes up as best. And so that's sort of what they're doing and they're really trying to lead a new expansion on oil exploration there. But, but people in Ogoni land are still being faced with um, having to clean up the oil spills that Shell has left and all of the other destruction as well. In fact, we are supporting women right now who have for years uh, been trying to um, do, uh, institute a, a cleanup operation in that area. Uh, when actually it's the government which, who should also be leading on that, and actually particularly Shell, which should be cleaning up its operations. Um, and again, how this connects to um, to sort of the to the climate negotiations and sort of what action is taken on climate is that these transnational corporations like Shell continue to work in collusion with our governments in Africa. There's obviously a lot of bribes that are involved, so, so bribing top officials and so on to be able to take on the positions and, and the sort of uh, advocacy that, um, that these big corporations generally have. There tends to be a revolving door as well between these corporations, the top executives and, and political elite as well. So you'll have a situation where uh, maybe a shell exec suddenly becomes a top political official uh, or the other way around. Maybe a top political official becomes an, a top exec uh, in, in a transnational corporation. And so this revolving door um, also uh, sort of makes sure that their influence is firmly held and they, they are entrenched in the system always, either through individuals or through whole corporations also sitting at the tables of the where where decisions are being made. So I'll give an example of um, of the African mining in Daba, which is an event that is hosted uh, once a year in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and it's it's basically a space where the governments and these top uh, polluting companies or corporations um, have their discussions about how to expand mining across Africa. Civil society generally doesn't have much space um, at all within those. And, and I think it's a similar thing within the COPs and we find that we have less and less space as, as the years go on. But, but corporations are basically there securing deals, um, developing policy, uh, pushing through strategy on how to really entrench um, an extractivist sort of future. They also try to do this social license thing, so buy a social license in many different ways in countries. Um, and and we, we see that in many different, in the most recent example is um, an Australian company in Madagascar, uh, which is uh, trying to develop a mine there um, and they've they've been getting strong resistance from communities against this uh, mine. But during this COVID period, they've used the opportunity to be able to deliver food parcels to to people um, and give them all sorts of other things, uh, sort of buying them off 
uh, in a sense so that they can continue their mining operations. Um, and, and in a broader perspective, as I said, they try to buy their, their social license um, in, these, in, these, um, in these different countries and in these different ways. Um, I mean, they operate generally without, with, I mean, sorry, with impunity, really. So causing land grabs, water grabs, as, as I've mentioned before, pollution, loss of livelihoods, and so on, and all with the consent and collusion with our governments. And so just to end um, on the point of why uh, it is so important in this next COP that is being held in Glasgow, uh, in terms of why these these polluters should not be involved. And Lala spoke quite a bit to this, but so maybe just to reinforce those ideas. You really can't have those who are causing the problem to be part of the part of the decision making and the solution to the problem. There's a there's a fundamental conflict of interest in this. And that is one of the main reasons that they really can't be part they can't be part and parcel of this. We've seen that they, when they are part of the decisions, that they push through these market-based solutions. They push through greenwashing kinds of solutions, this new net zero and so on, which, which are not about solutions at all to the climate crisis. All they are is about um, perpetuating the crisis, in fact, and ensuring that their operations continue well into the future under a different guise. Um, and it ensures that they, um, as I've just sort of alluded to, it ensures that they continue to perpetuate their business as usual operations. Um, and it's something that we should resist uh, as forcefully as we possibly can. Uh, and I think the other sort of broader thing is that they shift the narratives on actual solutions to solutions that, um, that aren't, aren't really actually going to be able to activate any kind of change. So I really think that um, as just a final concluding point, um, once again, that I'm, I'm really um, excited and happy that we are now bringing up not just the isolated experiences that we have on certain companies and uh, um, that are in influencing um, sort of decisions at the, at the cops and so on, but we're connecting and we're weaving through the different threads and building a broader sort of base and broader advocacy around stopping the polluters uh, from the influence that they have in these uh, negotiations. So yeah, I think that's about it from me, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for that, Trisha. That was brilliant. Um, yeah, a great reminder um, of what happens when corporate actors are given carte blanche to like pursue their own interests. And yeah, like the insidious ways that big polluters can affect um, the negotiations. So yeah, I'm super glad you came. And like, I think there's so much for um, people here in the UK to think about, particularly with like kind of global connections and like um, solidarity um, in mind. So our uh, final contributor is one of our own. Um, Lewis Conan Rowe um, is one of our organisers at Glasgow Calls Out Polluters and also works on um, fossil fuel finance with our sister campaign Divest Strathclyde. Uh, Lewis will fill us in on the lay of the land in the UK as the UK government after all who alongside Italy are the COP26 hosts. Um, so Lewis will fill us in with what's going on in the UK, as well as what's going on more locally um, in Glasgow and Scotland. All right, Lewis, uh, the stage is all yours, and I'm going to go and print here um, for you as well. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, so to start, um, I'd just like to, we kind of know already, but I'd just like to reiterate how massive the, the opportunity of COP26 in Glasgow is. So. The COPs are the, the biggest international climate talks that happen every year. And COP26 is not just any other COP either. It's, it's a really major one. It's the one that's going to follow up COP21 where the Paris Agreement was formed. So this is a really massive COP and it's happening in Glasgow, just 15 minutes down the road from where I live, which just feels like a kind of absolutely insane uh, opportunity to actually make a difference. But of course, the flip side of that is that because it's such a massive, massively important COP, the kind of corporate capture attempts that have been outlined already in the previous two talks are being ramped up 
in relation to this COP specifically, and that's something that we have to watch out for. Uh, I'm going to start with a bit of good news, or what seems certainly to be good news, which is that the UK government has made a commitment to having all sponsors of COP26 meet sustainability criteria. And I think this is testament to the success of campaigns in the past that this is, this is being discussed at all. So the specific wording of that is that all sponsors must have strong climate credentials. We are looking for businesses who have set ambitious net zero commitments by 2050 or earlier with a credible short-term action plan to achieve this, e.g. science-based targets. So that sounds pretty good that they're subscribing to science-based targets and there needs to be net zero commitments and a short-term action plan. There's a lot that is good about that and I think should be welcomed. But as Lala has discussed already, there are kind of flaws with this also. So the, the term net zero, often the net zero element of that is doing a lot of work. So when we say net zero emissions, there are lots of ways you can kind of get around actually reducing emissions by relying on things like carbon capture and storage or offsetting, which don't actually reduce the emissions themselves. So we, it's something that we need to keep an eye on there. Uh, and when the business minister, Kwesi Kwarteng, was asked whether this, this commitment would mean that fossil fuel companies were excluded from COP26, he actually declined to answer that. And he's previously stated quite positive things about uh, fossil fuel companies in the UK. So when talking about oil and gas, UK's proposed ambitions for uh, net zero, uh, slide two, Scott, uh, he said that Roadmap 2035, which was kind of the name of their document that outlined this, shows how seriously the UK oil and gas sector is taking its mission to decarbonize and support the transition to net zero emissions by 2050. And Paul Wheelhouse, who is a, a member of the Scottish Parliament, has also said quite similar things. So it, it, I think it's fair to say that in the minds of many politicians, uh, fossil fuel companies or other big polluters do seem to be allowed to be included in this, even though I think many of us would agree that having strong climate credentials ought to automatically exclude fossil fuel companies. Uh, the way that politicians in the UK are thinking about it seems to be somewhat different. So I think that's definitely something that we need to watch out for. And we can see that this is already starting to happen. So slide three, Scott. So there's already been um, news, which kind of leaked that BP has been announced as a, a key stakeholder in the climate summit. Um, so this kind of follows on from quite similar approaches the UK government have taken at COPs in the past. So it certainly seems like there's a gulf here emerging between the, the really positive step that seems to have occurred with those limits on sponsorship of COPs, but also the continued involvement of really massive polluters like BP. Slide four, please. Uh, and it's really important to note that, uh, as many of you may have heard recently, BP have kind of really seemingly stepped up their net zero ambition uh, with kind of a really major publicity announcement, which was, by the way, perfectly timed with the announcements that the COP, the COP committee were making about sponsorship at COP26, which seems uh, not very coincidental. Um, although they've made this seemingly much bigger commitment to getting to net zero, they're still in no way aligned with keeping warming to 1.5 degrees, which is what the Paris Agreement says we should be aiming for, and nor is any other uh, oil major. So it seems highly inconsistent that uh, we're... Uh, what do the orange nose mean inside? Basically, it, this um, chart was put together by um, Oil Change International, um, so if you just look at the, the left hand column, that's kind of what ambition they think fossil fuel companies ought to be signing up to in order to be compliant with the Paris Agreement. And no means they're not doing that at all in red. And orange no means they're kind of slightly not doing that, but still basically doing that. A yellow means that they're doing something. And there are actually two other criteria, a light green and a dark green, which are basically not used at all in this chart because no fossil fuel company gets close to achieving those. So they're not just uh, a little way off being compliant with Paris agreements, they're a long, long way off. So there's basically a lot of work to do. 
in order to demonstrate what should be the really obvious fact that fossil fuel companies do not have strong climate credentials as announced by the um, by the, the rules on sponsorship. Um, and to note, next slide, that uh, BP are still involved in lobbying to limit climate action. Again, not very strong climate credentials there. And slide six, it's not just about the fossil fuel companies themselves, it's also about fossil fuel finance. So we can see here in this um, page on the COP26 website, um, which lists friends of COP, we've got the non-executive director of Barclays, um, Barclays being one of the, the biggest funders of fossil fuel extraction as well as fracking and other unconventional methods. So there's a lot of kind of dodgy uh, climate wrecking companies getting in here, um, even though the, the kind of on the face of it, the, the requirements seem quite stringent. And this is in a way unsurprising given that there have been kind of huge attempts at corporate capture uh, already leading way up to before this announcement took place. If you go to the next slide, Scott, um, the recent um, freedom of information request, which was referenced earlier by a group called Culture Unstained, uh, has shown that there's been a huge amount of talks held between the UK government and private fossil fuel firms about COP26. Um, so mainly what I'm going to talk about is Equinor, Shell and BP. Uh, who discussed involvement of COP26 at more than 13 separate meetings with the UK government. And these are just the ones that we've heard about. Next slide. Um, so I think a really kind of crazy one that comes out of this is this email from Equinor to the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Department of the UK government, which asks, if I were to ask you, ballpark, how much money you would like from us for what and with what visibility for us, what would you say? <laughs> Which is pretty um, open about what they want to get out of it. Uh, and a meeting held in May, uh, there, there was kind of further discussion of this, which included saying what Equinor's view of what a successful COP26 would deliver and what Equinor might offer His Majesty, Her Majesty's government at COP26. So clearly Equinor were, were trying to frame themselves as really key players at COP26 from the start. Uh, next slide. Uh, as far as BP goes, they've had meetings with the COP president, Alok Sharma, the business minister, Kwasi Kwarteng, Angela Ledsam, and the business energy and industrial strategy permanent secretary, uh, repeatedly bringing up partnering on COP26. In a meeting with them, Kwasi Kwarteng said, the more BP can do to proactively create an offer for government, the quicker government will be able to move on our end to work together. So that kind of gives you a sense of, the, of uh, his take on partnering with fossil fuel companies. And you can just see from the, the slides and the, the look of these freedom of information requests, a massive amount has been redacted. So all this information we're getting about uh, the proposals for the involvement of fossil fuel companies, this is just what we were able to see. There's a huge amount which has been completely redacted in, in order to protect their, their business interests, uh, however you might. Uh, understand what those business interests are. Probably their business interests are trying to limit uh, the, the effectiveness of the COP26 talks. Um, and in response to these freedom of information requests that came out, uh, Baroness Boycott in the House of Lords uh, asked the government if they would rule out fossil fuel companies. And again, they refused to basically answer the question and just restated the earlier uh, information I shared about sponsorship of COP26. Uh, slide 10, please. So this is looking pretty bleak in many ways, but I think there are still a lot of opportunities for us to fight back against this. So I've, I've talked quite a lot about the UK government um, as a really important pressure point for us to try and influence COP26. The fact that they have put out this announcement about sponsorship and don't seem to be in line with it is a really important and useful campaigning tool for us that we can leverage that while at previous COPs, there was no announcement at all. There was just an assumption that fossil fuel companies should be involved. So the fact that we can really point out this glaring inconsistency is a very valuable campaigning tool for us. Another interesting thing about COP26 is because it's being held in Glasgow, but is a UK government 
hosted event. There is also a friction between the UK government and the Scottish government, and the Scottish government are very keen to use COP26 to really highlight their green credentials and try and portray themselves in a very positive light, um, often by comparison to the UK government. So there's a pressure point there as well. And there are also more local pressure points in Glasgow itself. So Glasgow City Council has declared a climate emergency and has announced they're going to try to reach net zero by 2030, which is a quite ambitious target. Uh, and again, are keen to try and use COP26 as a, a springboard to show off what they're doing. There's quite a lot of different players and access points here, as well as, of course, campaigning aimed at the, the big polluters themselves. So including fossil fuel companies and fossil fuel finance. And there's a lot of, as we've heard from previous speakers, a lot of good work happening, a lot of allies out there, um, including groups like Culture Unstained, Biofuel Watch, Friends of the Earth and 350.org. So there are opportunities here. Um, the fact that COP26 is happening in Glasgow um, is a major leverage point for us. So just to finish off, I'll talk about what we're doing and what our plans are. So. Glasgow Calls Out Polluters is a, a Glasgow-based grassroots campaign aiming to prevent big polluter influence with COP26. We're open for anyone to join and are made up of members from a wide variety of existing local groups. Um, we use this term big polluters because the issue goes beyond just fossil fuel companies and carbon emissions uh, to other organisations including banks and mining companies. So some of the methods we're working on uh, include an open letter, uh, these are the five demands included in that open letter, which align quite closely with the demands that Lala was talking about, about um, corporate capture cops more generally. So we're trying to get organisations to sign up to this open letter, as well as getting signatories for a petition. Um, if you go to the next slide, Scott, um, we're also working on various other publicity tools, including a polluter watch page on a website, which is uh, being continuously updated with further information about uh, attempts at corporate capture for COP26 by big polluters. We're also working on a polluters map of Glasgow and Scotland showing important sites, which is something that we think can be useful for education purposes, but also valuable for other campaigners who are looking for opportunities for protests or direct action, kind of collating that information together in one place. We're also working on encouraging venues in Glasgow not to host polluters, so thinking of kind of hotels, but also venues where talks and discussions might take place because there are often a huge number of side events held around COPs as well as the official ones. So this may be another opportunity for us to try and influence uh, kind of uh, or limit polluter influence on a more local level also. Uh, on to the last slide, please, Scott. So I think it's fair to say that because of the uh, complications that have arisen around coronavirus, uh, we have been uh, much more online this year than we would have liked to be. So we've been focusing more on sort of gathering information, putting together our website, making connections. Um, but we're now very keen to kind of start pushing things a bit further. So we're looking to kind of work with others. We're looking to have more people get involved. We're open for anyone to join and work with us in any way. So there's the kind of contact information for us. If you are interested in working on um, COP26 on a more local level, then please do get in touch with us. We're always looking for more people to work with and, and kind of build power going forwards. Uh, thank you. And that's everything I wanted to say. <laughs>